wonderful hello uh, to everybody to this uh, panel on the afternoon of the second day of this wonderful conference, Young People, Migration and the Demographic Challenges in the Western Balkans. I'm really happy uh, to be the moderator of this panel on domestic reforms, part one, uh, towards a better image of skills and labor market. Uh, a warm welcome also goes to my panelists, uh, Ivana Alexis uh, in Belgrade, Barbara Gerber in Wilsbyburg, uh, Nora Hassani in Pristina, Boris Djokic in Zagreb, Francesca Mucho in Tirana. Uh, so we have five panelists and I, my thanks goes also to the organizers of this um, very important conference, which is I think timely, even though we have a specific situation when it comes to the corona pandemic. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to talk about the future and we have to talk about these topics as match of skills and labor market uh, needs and demands uh, when it comes to the young generation. Um, just to set a frame maybe for this um, for this panel. Uh, we have heard uh, also already yesterday a lot uh, of uh, the question or that it's important to, to talk about education, about the systems, uh, educational systems in the region, uh, about the needs uh, or the question which skills are needed and so on. Um, and we have a specific situation uh, when it comes to the region that we talk about high unemployment rates and uh, specifically when it comes to the use uh, but at the same time, uh, we have uh, comments uh, from the business side that there is also a lack of skilled workforce. So, of course, one part is that, uh, and we are talking about this topic of migration and uh, why young people leaving the region, but uh, there's a second point which we will discuss here in this panel about the demands uh, of the labor market and uh, the skills um, uh, given by the but by the given educational systems. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, hand over uh, directly to my first panelists, or no, before, before I do this, uh, maybe just I would like to quote uh, or give one figure um, when it comes to, to, to the question how companies in the region are uh, uh, see the situation, whether skills uh, of young people match to the needs they have with their companies. And there are the latest figures of the Balkan business barometer. And uh, only for Serbia, we have a figure which is um, by 58% that companies say, yes, uh, the skills uh, the young people have are matching with our needs. Uh, the most worse figure I would say uh, comes from Bosnia and Herzegovina where 24 or 28% uh, just agree that the skills are matching the needs of their companies, but 24% fully disagree. So obviously we are not, we don't have to talk about the question whether this is the right uh, or whether this uh, thesis is the right one uh, that's skills are not matching, but how can we achieve uh, a better communication maybe uh, among uh, these specific and different systems. So without any ado, I would like to uh, give uh, the floor uh, to Ivana Alexic, uh, who is Senior Education Consultant wider Europe with the British Council in Belgrade and is an expert on our topic. And uh, Ivana, I would like to ask you uh, the following question, being an expert on Serbia's education policy. Um, I would like to ask you to share with us your assessment about the current situation in the region and what are the problems young graduates in the region are facing when trying to find a job and why do they feel they have to move abroad? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, you can hear me well. Um, I am uh, quite pleased and I have to say also excited uh, to be a part of, of this uh, distinguished panel. And um, I mean, we have been uh, listening a lot of uh, very good discussions uh, starting from last night and earlier this morning. We have covered it all. <laughs> At least this is, <laughs> this is how I feel. Uh, so instead of going uh, a set of specific going over a set of specific points which I have uh, already outlined in the background uh, paper uh, which was uh, prepared for this conference, I decided to reframe uh, uh, my approach uh, and um, I'm going to talk about two points. Uh, 
One is basically a statement uh, that recognizes that youth of the Western Balkans today or adult, young adults of the Western Balkans represent one of the largest marginalized groups. The second point I want to say, or I want to discuss is um, that youth are not a homogeneous group. This has very important uh, uh, implications to how we are going to be addressing uh, uh, this problem. So going to the first point, uh, youth in the Western Balkans, and I think that's been clearly illustrated by a number of different examples, uh, uh, personal stories coming from the young people who took part in the conference, as well as numerous experts and representatives of international organizations, youth are faced with different exclusionary pressures. Those come both from the education, but also from the labor uh, market side. So let me just give you one example how this exclusionary pressure functions within the education. We haven't really spoken much about education inequalities and um, what that means in a life of an individual young person is that as they move forward to the next level of education, the private cost of education increases. That virtually translates in the young people's inability to enter, for instance, higher education um, uh, programs or institutions and signifies that societies are not staying open or not investing enough to let uh, all uh, young generations uh, to get uh, the required or desired uh, education level degrees. What does that mean uh, in employment? Um, if we dissect uh, the issue of uh, barriers to entry to the labor market and we look at specifics, we can see that uh, the things are really not the same in public uh, versus private sector. In public sector, we know that there's a lot of nepotism. Young people talk about uh, uh, needing to have personal connections in order to access uh, those kind of jobs, which are, as we heard, uh, way more desirable because they're stable, they bring uh, secure monthly salaries. But in private sector, young people get discouraged because they become aware that they're not qualified enough, that they miss skills. And I think one of the first young uh, um, um, persons talking last night within one of the videos said that she realized that she needs more education because she couldn't keep up with the, the requirements of the private sector. Uh, why is this happening? It's happening because uh, we have all recognized that there's a lack of practical experience or more precisely, there's a lack of opportunities for young people to acquire practical skills. Education in the Western Balkans by and large takes place in isolated education facilities. Things have been changing. There's a lot of effort to introduce schemes to allow work-based training and similar things, particularly in vocational education and training reforms. However, uh, I mean, we need to think about other young people, about internship and traineeship opportunities, which are not uh, yet there. Uh, all of this then translates in a very traumatic uh, transition for youth from school uh, to work. And we can talk about that because the long-term unemployment of the young people is really a cause of concern. The end result is what we have been discussing. It's a very high uh, youth unemployment rate for young people, which is on average at least two times higher than the overall uh, unemployment rate in the Western Balkan countries. The second point will be uh, much shorter. Youth, as I said, are not homogeneous group. So, I mean, if we talk, for instance, of condition of young people who have graduated from secondary schools, that's gonna be very different from the situation of young people who have completed higher education. But even more importantly, uh, we haven't been using um, sufficient policy instruments to support learning and labor market inclusion of those young people who belong to truly vulnerable uh, groups. Those include young women, those include Roma youth, those include youth with disabilities. There are other, but let's focus on these. Even though the Western Balkan states do have by and large um, anti-discrimination law, laws, this hasn't been uh, really fully implemented. And then the end result of this is that the rates 
of those young people who are not in education, not in employment or not in training are much higher, two times higher for these young people than for the overall young. So I'll stop here. This is just by way of introduction. Thanks to, thank you very much, Ivana, uh, for these insights and uh, for also bringing up the topic that especially within the youth, we have a specific group of young people which are even worse integrated uh, when we talk about integration into the labor markets than the use at, as itself. And uh, I would like also to um, to give or just to, to, to ask Francesca later on uh, in, in her statement also to, to, to comment on, on, on these topics, um, <clears throat> uh, especially uh, maybe if there are any ideas how to, to, to deal with these heterogeneous um, uh, groups. And, uh, but before uh, I ask later on also Francesca to comment on, on, on these topics, uh, I would like to, to, to uh, include a, a technical note. Uh, I forgot to ask all of the uh, participants uh, in the audience, you can use the question and answer function to ask questions and uh, to, to the panelists. And uh, after the first round of introductory statements of the panelists, we will open the floor for these questions. And my wonderful co-moderator, Christian, will then pick up the questions uh, from, uh, from the uh, question and answer uh, function. Uh, and we will give it to uh, our panelists. And the second one, and that's why I had to, to, to make the sign to Ivana, is uh, that we have asked our panelists to, to um, stick to, to the five minutes uh, for their first statement, as we would like to answer as much as possible um, questions. And so uh, I leave the, um, the field of technical remarks, and I would like to introduce Ms. Gaba, uh, who is head of global professional education with Drexelmeyer Group in Wilsbyburg. And this is really, we are really happy to have you here because this is really something we have, we, we cannot talk about um, education and the, the match of skills and labor market That's needs fun. without having a representative of a company Council. which is producing in the region. And uh, you are uh, at Drexelmeyer in charge for building up professional education departments all over the world. Yes. At the moment, Drexelmeyer employs, uh, as you mentioned, around about 1,300 apprentices uh, in more than 30 plants. Uh, when it comes to the region, uh, we, can, we can say there is a production site in North Macedonia and Kavadazi. And uh, if I'm not wrong, which was uh, established in 2012, and uh, employees, uh, as I uh, have heard, uh, about 5,000. Maybe you can uh, just... Yeah. Also, uh, that's the right figure. Okay. That's the right figure. Perfect. And uh, so, obviously, um, you are really the right person to give us an insight uh, about uh, the current situation. And so, my question to you was that there's a guiding question of the panel uh, that how to better match the skills of labor market and demand and how to improve young people's labor market integration. I would like to ask you uh, to set the frame from a company's perspective, how Drexelmeyer assess the situation, especially in the region. What needs to be done uh, to improve the situation by the governments? Because one side is that companies can do a lot of things and a lot of projects, but uh, there's also most probably a need for uh, new regulations, uh, for instance. And uh, what can the business community do to hand in ideas and support the governmental reforms? Maybe you can give us Speak some on. insights about your experiences to introduce vocational training in North Macedonia as well. So it's a quite a set of questions, but uh, I hope, uh, or I'm looking forward to your introduction and mm -hmm. remarks on these questions. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so as I understood, I only have five minutes for the whole sentence, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I prepared much maybe too we much. can split a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. So I have to make it very short. I really prepared myself very well, but now I see I work too much on it. First of all, I was surprised when you told me how much the, in, in some countries that the companies think uh, the young people are in the right way educated for the needs of the companies. I am around the world. Uh, and excuse me when I'm be sometimes quite frank, 
and open, but I don't want to insult anybody. What I realized around the world is that a lot of companies think they are, very, they are on a very good way, but believe me, they are not. So if I compare what does a company need, uh, and I stay mostly to the vocational education, uh, what I realize is that the need, however it is, the contents hardly uh, uh, compares the need of the company. For example, if you think how, if you ask companies, if you ask companies, uh, let's get one example. If you ask companies uh, and ask them what they need, it depends what kind of company do you ask. Mm. Uh, for example, if you ask a small company, a local company, which is not in, in a technology, in high technology, they are always satisfied. Sorry when I say it. But if you ask a company who goes on automatization system, on digitalization, on robotic and things like this, yes, the engineers are quite qualified in a very good way and very high well, but you also need professional workers, qualified workers. And actually, actually, that's a need what we are missing. That's why we are doing. We spend a lot of effort and money to build up professional education, not like the Germans do it, but we want to reach the level of the German professional education, which is called dual system. So that's why we are in the countries. That's actually why we are in Macedonian. We started in Macedonian years ago, professional education, and it was actually quite easy for us because we were the only company at that time who started it. And we worked very close, to, close together with the AHK, the city, the city hall, the school, and the government. And what we realized, uh, we realized we have to start early because our companies are changing very fast. When I started six years ago, seven years ago, working with Stretzenmeyer, our plants had uh, a did harness for the car. So we had a lot of handwork. But if you go now in our company, we have big machines. We have robotic system, automatization. So we, as I said, engineer is not the problem, but the workers, the maintenance people, the application uh, technicians, they don't have the proficiency what we need. And that's actually what we realized in Macedonian. And that's the reason why we started to build up a professional education together with the school. And we are at the beginning, not in the middle and not in the end. And as I said, the complexity of the technology is changing very, very fast, very, very fast. The increase of mechanics and network of process, it's amazing how what the young people have to learn to do. And, and if you go on the matching, uh, it's, it actually can maybe match for a small company, which is years behind the technology, but not at a, at a company who has a high technology. The matching doesn't work. That's actually why we are working in it. Maybe it seems unpolite, but that's how it is. And I still have to say we are on a very good work uh, way, but it takes, I'm sure, years to reach the, the needs of the companies, the companies who are, on a high, who are working in a high technology area. And I know, I, I listen to other panels, I know, if you qualify the people, maybe some people or a lot of people will leave the company, uh, the country. That's a problem what I realize. And that's actually always what people tell me. Oh, if we, if we qualify, then they will leave our company on and maybe they will also leave the country. Yeah, that's a problem. But still, you have to qualify the people to get companies to come companies in the country and to hold the company, the companies in the country. That's actually my area. That, and that's, I'm, I'm quite lucky because my proficiency is, as you already said, I, my work is to build up professional education around the world. So what else can I tell you? 
thank you so much for this intervention. And uh, so maybe, but just one remark, uh, as you mentioned, and uh, as, or as we mentioned, you are in charge for, for building up those kind of uh, professional education structures uh, all over the world. Uh, do you see a specific advantage when it comes to the Western Balkans? Do you see, so now you have uh, the plant in North Macedonia, but is there any idea of Drexelmeyer also to talk about regionalization of uh, and, and cooperation maybe um, with other companies to uh, support those structures, just as a question. Yeah. As we talk about regional integration all the, the whole time, maybe that would be. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we do it. Uh, maybe to get to know, we are building a professional education next in Poland. We have uh, five plants in Romania where we have it already, uh, Moldavia and Macedonia. So as a company, we are actually work very close together. All our training departments are working around the world together. So that's one point. And what we also do, like in Romania, we are working together very, very uh, close with Continental, with Schaeffler, with Hella, with Marquardt. Uh, we even work with uh, Chambers very close together to build up a professional education system in the company. And to make it clear, we don't want to take the German system and put it on a local system. That's not the idea behind it. The idea is matching the both systems, see what's good in one side and the other side, and put it together, always with the government. So uh, also what we do in Macedonia, we also work together with companies. So we, we share our knowledge. We show what we do. Like uh, if you want to uh, build up a school, a workshop area, it's a school. We give all our knowledge away. You know, I make the layout, the technical layout. I even show them what material they could use. I only propose it, but we work very, very close to with other companies and we are open. And why do we do it? Because if we find a lot of shareholders, a lot of companies who work together, it's easier for the uh, government build, to build up a system like this. And of course, it makes it much easier if we find local companies to work with us together. But it's not easy because professional education, it's very, very expensive for a company. Like we do it at the moment. So only to give you an example, I have a a fully equipped workshop area in Macedonian. I, we have two trainers in Macedonian. So we have around about 60, 70 young people in Macedonian in this, in this field. So you, you have to pay the young people. We pay them always salary. It doesn't matter if we have to do or not. So we need two trainers and we have, we have to educate our trainers. So we, we invite them to Germany or we come to Macedonian and we also give uh, a lot of uh, material to the school because we have to help the school to, to improve their own workshop areas. So that makes uh, professional education sometimes not very interesting for local companies because long, local companies are not used to spend a lot of money. So. In Germany, it's, you know, it's over 100 year old. So it's quite easy to do it. But to make it short, it's very important that you work together with other companies on a long distance. Because if you have it as a government system, a public system, that makes life easier. And we also want to trade the people with a degree, so an official degree, to go on to improve their knowledge and their life. Thank you so much uh, for these insights, um, Mrs. Gerber. And I think that's important uh, also to make this topic that uh, once or there is an investment in the future uh, of these young people by giving professional education, uh, despite the fact that, again, also your company obviously has to, has to deal with the issues as leaving the company and leaving the country. So again, also for you and for the businesses, it's important to discuss and to get more insights about what are the reasons for leaving, come, when, when, when people will come back and whatever. So again, this is something I would 
say, I would like to highlight that obviously there's a dialogue, a constant dialogue needed among all stakeholders, including the businesses and the CSOs and the governments about this topic, not about just about uh, education and how to match, and you mentioned this as well, that there are different uh, layers, uh, and uh, but also about the, the question how we can keep the young people uh, in, in their home countries. Um, saying this, uh, I would like to go uh, to our next panelist, but before, before I give Nora the floor, we will play a video, right? So I would like the techniques to start the video. Guten Tag, guten Tag, Mirena, mein Name. Was kann ich für Sie tun? Për mua është një ndjenë shumë e mirë, me punu Gjermanisht, për Gjermanin, në Kosovë, ma dje kemi edhe shumë pëntorë të cilët janë këthy prej Gjermanisë për me punu në Kosovë, pasi që kushtet e punës dhe ambjenti punës është i njëjtë. Wir arbeiten mit vielen deutschsprechenden Mitarbeitern. Wir haben aber auch weitere internationale Unternehmen, auch viele anderssprachige Mitarbeiter, die gutes Kundenservice äh, leisten. Das ist im Vergleich, wenn wir einen Benchmark ziehen in Europa, ist Kosovo aktuell the place to be. Unser Ziel, nachhaltig Arbeitsplätze zu sichern, aufzubauen und ähm, Potenzial ist mehr als nur das vorhanden. Pasi që gjua Gjermane ka arritur në një nivel të lartë të vlirësimit në Kosovë dhe si pas përvojësi me 4 vjeqare në këtë firmë, në këtë kompani, e përjashtoj mundësine e emigrimit jashtë vendit. Ja. Uh, so this was one of the videos which was also produced by Deutsche Welle specifically for this conference. And uh, Nora, uh, you are as the managing director of the German Kosovo Business Association, um, the one representing actually the, um, yeah, the, 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 you are the first source of information, I would say, when it comes to Kosovo's labor market. And um, since 2017, I would like to add, you are the uh, managing director uh, of this association and you have a long uh, tradition of cooperating with Germany uh, in different um, positions. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, from all Western Balkan countries, Kosovo's youth unemployment rate, rate is one of the highest, and it was mentioned mm -hmm. uh, here uh, in the video as well. And uh, so uh, what is the feedback of companies investing and engaging in Kosovo about the labor market? What can you tell us about the skills uh, which are available in the country? And uh, where do the companies see a need uh, of skilled workforce uh, in which areas and where they see also the, uh, the needs uh, for, yeah, uh, more um, ambitions and moves uh, from the government sides. Uh, are there projects already implemented also to train young people? Um, so I have in mind projects uh, financed and supported by the GIZ, but mm -hmm. maybe you can uh, give us more insights uh, about this. And maybe you can also comment on the video we have just seen. Uh, maybe Weblink Kosovo, uh, just to mention, this is one uh, of the bigger investments also of a German mm -hmm. company, which is already present in five regions, I, uh, as I know, with 1,000 employees. So obviously it's a big, uh, uh, yeah, big institution or big company. So Nora, the floor is yours. Five Thank minutes. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'll try. There are many questions, <laughs> so it's quite challenging. Yeah, the video was quite impressive, right? Uh, so um, they have the motto work German and live in Kosovo. As you've seen, we have a very young population. 70% are under 35 years old and our demographic structure is never a problem when it comes to workforce. So many people are well educated, speak different languages. And most probably you don't know this, but uh, the highest concentration of German speakers per capita outside Germany, Austria and Switzerland is Kosovo. So these are the reasons why uh, many um, investors uh, are attracted to uh, invest in call centers and customer support centers, as we've seen in the video. We have web help, speaks, teleperformance, uh, Sutherland offering really services to well-known international clients and they have established trust even though their clients know and are aware that the services are coming from Kosovo. So this means that we offer high quality services and we obviously have people uh, to do that. But there are also local companies that provide customer support services and business process uh, outsourcing services in very specific fields such as e-procurement and so on. And um, yeah, these are not only call center related tasks, but really more complicated tasks. And um, we have also a very high and uh, fast growing IT sector who are exporting services, not only to the EU, but also to the US market. And having all this in mind, all this information sounds very promising, right? But uh, what we saw in the video, it's just a success story of a very specific sector. So there in this sector, we have very good employers. They are offering uh, competitive salaries and um, they're really working closely with the people in order to refine their already existing skills. And I have to admit that this is quite uh, an exception for Kosovo yet. So uh, Kosovo's economy should not uh, attract only investors and call centers. We know that this is very unreliable as, um, as a concept. There's a lot of potential out there in other sectors as well. And the reality in those sectors, when it comes to the gap, what uh, the workforce is offering and uh, what the labor market needs is totally different. Uh, we have uh, many young people and uh, it's really shocking that this uh, unemployment rate uh, for youth is very high, over 50%. Uh, we have in general a problem with unemployment in Kosovo. Less than one third of the adult population has a job and almost nine out of 10 women are not working. So let that sink in. So you see, we have a very high youth and women unemployment rate, uh, which is among the highest worldwide. And then we come to this a very absurd thing. So there are obviously companies uh, searching and seeking to find the right people. And then on the other hand, we have all these young people who are unemployed. So should it not be really easy to connect them both and to find a solution for these problems? Uh, but it's not that easy. Uh, in the past three years, I had at least 400 uh, meetings with business representatives and they always complain that when it comes to recruiting, it's difficult to find people because they're lacking experience or they are not having the right skill sets. So uh, that is a problem if you uh, analyze all these discussions and if you analyze the diverse reports that are written by the World Bank, UNDP, local and international think tanks, we come to just one conclusion. There are three different stakeholders or pillars, if I might call them, um, and they don't have the right framework to interact with each other. And I, I'm talking here about the private sector, the employers, the companies, and then we have the youth as uh, potential employees, and then the training and um, education providing uh, uh, centers. There is a rarely a dialogue uh, between them. So sometimes, and I don't wanna sound very pessimistic here, um, I tend to think that we're living in parallel universes. Uh, companies are not uh, well connected with the education and training system in Kosovo. They're not well informed about what's out there. So what are the uh, offers uh, that uh, uh, vocational education training uh, centers and schools are offering? And um, when they recruit, they don't even know what's out there because they rely on informal networks. So they rely on recommendations from their personal networks. And um, this is very challenging then on the other hand, right? For the youth to get uh, and, and see those vacancies. Um, and 
I mean, this topic is very broad. I don't know if I uh, can uh, wrap it up in five minutes. Uh, I know that we will uh, talk about this later on, but it is uh, clearly, uh, clearly this problem that there uh, needs to be um, yeah, a better communication, a better dialogue. And we, have, we need to have a framework that encourages this uh, cooperation between all these three pillars. So it was mentioned before, uh, the education uh, system in each of our country is weak. We don't have, good, Serbia has started to implement uh, a law which has uh, uh, elements of the, dual, of the German dual system. But in most of the countries, we really have like a, a classic uh, uh, old uh, system in place where it was even mentioned in the panel before, uh, pupils are forced to learn by heart and to, um, and not to have this uh, uh, practical approach of problem solving, teamwork, communication and soft skills that are needed uh, from the companies. And uh, when it comes to vocational education schools, I think they, they need uh, a more, uh, they need to connect with businesses more in order to have the right curriculars to offer uh, the programs that are need, uh, needed and linked to the labor market needs. And there's no practical approach. And I will give you just one short example uh, without exceeding my time. Um, in one of the reports, and it's the re uh, skill assessment reports from the UNDP, it's mentioned that for the wood processing sector, there are two vocational schools in Kosovo and five voc vocational education training centers. And they are not even located in the regions where wood processing firms are located. So you see, uh, with uh, this very short example, uh, we can illustrate that even this is not working. I mean, there are some approaches and there are really good projects, especially by the GIZ, who have um, started to work on both sides uh, with the Ministry of Education, with the professional um, education training centers, but also with businesses to implement in the job training. But these projects and programs that we have in our donor base, they are still on a scale, uh, on a small scale. We need to have this Kosovo wide and we need to have uh, a reform system. And when it comes to youth, um, well, I last uh, remark. See... <laughs> last remark. Uh, okay. The last remark is my third pillar. Uh, so uh, you see that they're lacking even information. Uh, we don't have a, a systematic attempt to measure skills and demands. And um, our youth is, uh, is um, forced or forced. There's this big pressure from the society to have a university degree and uh, university degrees in law and in all these social sciences, whereas the, uh, the private sector, they need people uh, who are in mechatronics. They need people uh, who can uh, work uh, different uh, things uh, in regard to, um, uh, to uh, manufacturing, to operate machines. And so, uh, there's a huge mismatch, but it's not only because of the educational system, but also because of the lack of information and the communication between, between all three of them. And I will stop here and continue later on. Thank you so much, Nora, especially for taking up all to the point uh, that obviously there's much more dialogue among the stakeholders needed. Uh, maybe we can this, take this as one of the takeaways of this conference and uh, maybe we can leave it also to the governments uh, that uh, we would uh, like uh, to, to see more interaction because, be, be, um, among these stakeholders. And uh, also a thanks uh, for... for uh, also picking up the topic again, we are talking uh, about the question of how to get a job. Uh, do we need informal structures uh, to 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 uh, to get one or not? And uh, and the topic of uh, the lack of data. And uh, as I remember it rightly, Ivana, it's also one of your points uh, in your background paper that there is obviously a lack of data uh, about the the skills skills needed. And uh, uh, yeah. So the substance actually is uh, lacking uh, to, to really um, get ideas uh, on how to frame the reforms. But uh, I would like, before we discuss uh, all these topics in depth, I would like also to give the floor to Boris. And actually, if we talk about reforms, you are <laughs> one uh, person representing, like no other, <laughs> uh, this topic. And uh, so first, your current position is that you are the higher, re uh, higher research associate with the Institute for Social Research in Zagreb. But 
uh, you were one of the creators of the comprehensive curricular reform of early and preschools, elementary and secondary education in Croatia. And as I remember it rightly, there were a lot of protests uh, afterwards, not because you have done a bad job by creating these reforms, but really to pushing the reforms forward and the people supporting you, if I have it right in my mind. Uh, so I would like uh, to give the floor to you and asking the question that since 2013, Croatia joined the European Union. Uh, it, that this is not really a long time ago, but maybe you can share with us uh, your experience of Croatia's problems before and after joining the European Union in the context of educational reforms, because maybe is there any, is it a driving force maybe to, to implement much better the reforms uh, in the system or is there, do we have, do we just, can we see is any changes? That would be a question I would have. And what is needed to successfully implement educational reforms? Um, so that would be also one question. And again, five minutes. I know that's <laughs> it's not enough to answer <laughs> all details, but uh, I'm sure you will make it. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Anya, and, and hello. And it's going to be enough. Five, five minutes is more than enough. Uh, so, so sad that we could not meet in Germany. Uh, to, to come to your questions, uh, did the EU help or Croatia's joining EU, did it help reform efforts? I would say in some ways, yes. In some ways, it forced uh, at least some focus uh, on the decision makers to have a strategic way of thinking and to implement some elements of the uh, reform packages. However, there is always a kind of a wrong motivation in Balkans with regards to the reforms and EU. The motivation is such that you fulfill some kind of EU requirements. It shows a lack of self-respect on behalf of these countries. Uh, reforms should be done because of the people within the countries. It should be done because of the young people, if we talk about education and their own future. There was a lot of talk here about what kind of person do we have or what kind of um, skills or um, you know, like competences uh, portfolio should a young person have. I think that's the wrong way of looking at things. I think that first thing, uh, what policymakers should pose in all of these countries, including Croatia, is basically what kind of society do they want with regards to the education? Do they want to be uh, just a, you know, like montage societies for the developed world? Uh, or do they want to be just, you know, like the place where, you know, like people just take people away from and then put them in their own settings? Or there is something more here. Croatia, and an, all, I know all of these countries, including Kosovo, Albania, Serbia, Bosnia, Slovenia, you know, Macedonia, Montenegro, to name all of them. If I, if I forgot someone, I'm, I, I'm sorry. But, you know, like, they're not the, you know, like third world or the fourth world countries. They are the countries with a long tradition of education and long tradition of successful uh, education and successful educational systems. However, in the last 30 years, there has been a lack of focus on the education. There has been a lack on focus and the realization that the main potential of these countries is not a coal anymore, or is not the water anymore, or is not the ore anymore, or wood, it's person, young people. And based on that lack of realization, all of the problems follow. If you don't invest in education as a kind of main potential, and if you do not reform it because of the young people and because of its own society, but because of the EU or someone else, then you're in the wrong motivational section. Uh, there is a lot of talk here, and I know from the previous years that we talked, you know, like how to match the needs of the uh, economy and the needs of person. The needs of person are equal, they are vital to the needs of economy. If you just look at the economic perspective and take out the humanistic perspective of young person, then we're gonna to go to the clear cul-de-sac. You know, we're gonna be ending up in a, in a street without a way forward. What these countries should actually do is basically they should focus on the, you know, like flexible education, education which kind of gives us, someone was saying before, generic competences that could be, you know, like adaptable to the various changes in the ecological systems of wherever they work. However, in, in order to do that, there is a lot of thinking and a lot of wisdom needed for this thing to succeed over time. There are several elements which are absolutely necessary for educational reforms. First one is basically that the policymakers, and I'm here speaking about the crude politics, you know, like parties, if you want, they should have a long-term perspective in education. However, their perspective is extremely short-term. Their perspective is not anymore even the four-year perspective. It's often less, a half a mandate or a year. 
If you don't have a long-term perspective with regards to the educational reforms, then you're going to end up with a lot of political problems with regards to the change of the governments. However, in order to successfully reform education or educational system, you at least need two mandates or 10 years or maybe 15 years in order to come to the point where you know, like you would have significant changes within the system. However, at the, mo at the moment, in all of these countries, the political systems are such that they do not, they do not function at the level of cooperation, understanding of the you know, like core national or international interests with regards to the young people and their own interests. So if you ask me what are the necessary components of the successful educational reforms, these would be clearly a long-term vision, a wisdom, and reliance on a, you know, like scientific, practical and scientific advice with regards to carrying on of the reforms. It, you know, like once again, like for all of those who are listening to this, especially young people, you know, these are countries, you know, they're not the backwards of the Europe. They're not the worst there, there are. They're actually the places of significant historical, you know, like um, sparks. There are places of the significant, significant historical world knowledge. However, if we all leave, if you all just, you know, like leave and don't come back, there's going to be a less of that spark present. So my advice, and I'm ending up my five minutes beforehand, is basically that, you know, like one should also go and get the knowledge, go and get the internship, go and I'm, I'm the one who got, a, you know, like probably the, one of the world best knowledge that, that could be. I finished my doctoral studies in Cambridge, but there, there is a lot of space for fight here. A lot of space for fight, not in a pure political terms, but a lot of space for fight for a better future of young people, which actually starts in our countries. And these countries are also the places where these, these changes, successful changes could actually happen. Thank you very much for your intervention, uh, Boris, and uh, especially, uh, again, underlining this, this topic of a long-term perspective and a long-term vision which is needed when it comes to the educational reforms and, uh, again, also a cooperative uh, uh, move uh, of the governments, uh, and I would say also towards all the other stakeholders. Um, I would like to give the floor now to Francesca, uh, who is uh, the Secretary General of the Young Professional Network and the Youth Representative of Albania at RICO, uh, based in Tirana. And uh, Francesca is not our last speaker in this round because uh, it's just the last speaker, but it was uh, uh, not by accident that I took the decision to have Francesca uh, at the last speaker because I would like her to, to sum up as also, the, the, or not just sum up, but uh, to, to give some remarks to the interventions made before and uh, by, by all our other panelists and also picking up the question of um, having in mind your position as a director general of the Young Professional Network of Albania. Um, I would like you to set the frame regarding the guiding question of this panel from the perspective of the young people and also that's why including also the comments uh, uh, to, to, to the panelists we have, we have just heard. But do you see the reform or the need for reforms to better prepare young people for the labor markets because this is also in perspective um, it was touched a bit by, by Nora, and especially it was touched by Nora that there's obviously a lack of information also for the young people. So maybe there's something we can do together. But uh, how also, and there was a discussion, I think, yesterday or a comment on that one, how to make the voices much louder from the young people. And uh, so the floor is yours. And uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be today with you, and I hope that you have enjoyed the conference till now. Uh, let me first share a personal history about my integration within the labor market, that from the experience that I have and from the holded position is a common history of a young person in the Western Balkan. None of my studies, starting from the high school, continuing with a bachelor degree for administration and social policy, and concluding with my master for communication science, has equipped me with the necessary infrastructure to facilitate this case. Anyhow, Uh, 
now, Francesca. Unfortunately, we can't hear you that well. Maybe you can switch off the video, then we can hear you better. Maybe then the connection is better. So, and oh, can you hear me now? Yes, now it's much better. Maybe you can start again. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> <Okay>. much. <laughs> you were frozen, <laughs> but now it's much better. You can hear you. I was talking with a lot of passion and I was frozen. Okay. <laughs> So uh, let's start again. <laughs> Good afternoon again to everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be today with you. Uh, let me first share a personal history about my integration within the labor market that uh, from the experience that I have uh, and the holding position is the common history of a young person in Western Balkan. Are you hearing me? Yes, we hear okay. you. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> no. None of my studies, uh, starting from the high school, continuing with a bachelor degree for administration and social policy, and concluding with my master for communication science, has equipped me with the necessary infrastructure to facilitate my integration in the labor market, neither with the minimum skills to write a motivation letter. This is an ugly fact, but the needed truth in this case. Anyhow, due to my role as active citizen, I have learned this and much more through people with goodwill and endless participation in education programs, campaigns, training, etc. So there is a uh, cause-consequence connection between the education and the face mismatch of skills of young people in the labor market, and the problem needs to be addressed at its roots. Our dig. Uh, uh, our education system is still based on traditional methods inherited from the old political system who prepare students um, for a labor market and a society that no longer exists. And today it's not, any, it's, it's not enough anymore to ace reading and math. The students should be equipped with the ability to develop critical thinking, to adopt uh, with concept of active citizenship, which will also uh, be noticed in the culture of impunity, but also with skills uh, needed for the challenges of this epoch, world pandemic, fast te technological uh, evolution, populism, etc. A part of this necessity uh, was clear clearly emphasized uh, within the strategy of skills launched from the Europe European Union but uh, also on the paper that me and other speakers within the other panels has been developed. Uh, meanwhile, as we speak about the needed skills of young people, we also should speak about decent employment, where it's needed to strengthen monitoring labor institution and the lack of trade unions should be addressed. So young people to not complain about the lack of respect, respecting their labor rights, extended working hours, low salaries, etc. And so we would not have 92% of young people in the southeastern region that are attracted from the public sector, from its job security. But uh, we do not have like uh, people which. Uh, uh, which uh, say that the first reason uh, of migration is the quality of employment. So this, in, uh, in the, uh, this uh, situation uh, is a wake-up call for policymakers so that tangible changes can be undertaken. Uh, if I am uh, good with the time, I can proceed with a question about the You, you have time, so oh, okay. you, we can okay. proceed. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, and when um, about about uh, the issue raised from uh, Ivana in uh, in uh, her first. Francesca. Yes. Okay, so we hear you. So you wanted to to go back to the. Hello? Yes, um, I wanted to go back to the, yes, yeah. uh, about the first remark uh, about of Ivana, about uh, how to deal with the groups of uh, young people marginalized. Uh, and I think that um, there are a lot of action plans about uh, Roma community, um, youth people, but the problems, the problem is uh, 
in their implementation. Uh, from my point of view, uh, the, uh, the cooperation between the central government and the local governments should be increased by involving as well uh, NGOs that work with specific uh, target groups. So in one hand, we have the policies and in the other hand, we have uh, the, the grassroots organization and the, uh, the the local municipalities, the local level that uh, um, have the necessary information about uh, uh, these uh, young people. Thank you very much, Francesca, and also for sticking to the time limit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I, before I open the round, uh, the second round, especially for the questions uh, from the audience, I would like to just take up take up one point uh, which uh, you made uh, the question of trade unions in the region and uh, so there would be a good question on, on this one because they should be part of the dialogue within uh, uh, among uh, employers uh, so means businesses uh, governmental structures and and, and others um, so maybe we can in the second round also maybe you as the other panelists can pick up this question too how 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 what what role would you see because I think it's quite interesting to see the role here the trade unions here have in Germany uh, as structuring also a dialogue among employees and employers and uh, indeed kind of a lack of trade unions within the region as I understand it uh, or uh, once you see them there's a question what what role do they play and how many employees do they really represent so maybe that could be a force uh, supported so this is a question i would leave also to you um for for the second round but now i hand over to my co-moderator uh to put the questions uh, from the audience Yeah, thank you very much, Anya. Hello also from my side. Um, I have the privilege now to present the questions from the audience. And uh, there has been a debate that was almost as vivid as uh, in our panel today. And questions were mostly focusing on two areas of uh, problems regarding labor market integration. And um, one, uh, one uh, aspect of the comments was focusing on the need category that we have discussed already. And the questions were, um, on the one hand, of course, uh, how do you explain that people are in this category? Why do we see so many people in this category? Um, I remember Nora saying that 90% of all women are not working. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, Roma who are in this category and also other groups. Um, and another critical question on this was asking is this a stigmatization or actually a useful classification so probably you can also um, uh, answer uh, on this question and um, I think this is, is basically uh, a question for all people in the panel because it's it's applicable to all of your areas to answer it from a company perspective so why are these these need people not not uh, employable uh, easily if you're looking for uh, for people to qualify uh, from the view of education systems to the education experts and of course also uh, from the perspective of the young and especially young women um, what uh, what is the problem of of this category in the region so this is the first part the second part um, is uh, i would i would call it or summarize it as people excluded for other reasons and um, there was one question and i think it was uh, more or less directed uh, to Francesca, which asked, is there in Albania a real transparent job market for young people? And um, I would probably frame this, this question also in a bigger context on an issue we have not touched upon uh, so much so far, which is the politicization of the labor market. So um, the difficulty of finding a job, uh, we already heard the, uh, the point of uh, seeking jobs in the public sector, which often require uh, some kind of party alignment. So um, what, is, uh, what is the problem there and how could we get to a depoliticization of labor markets and uh, making it easier for young people to find jobs there? Um, finally, there was a third question and uh, somebody who 
who raised his hand, but um, it's down now. Um, but he wrote the question in the chat, um, and I will just read it out for you. Um, it's, uh, it's also kind of a comment. It says, the vocational schools are focusing to what the EU market is asking mostly, so somehow a lot of youth are attending to the vocational schools, uh, which is perfect, but with a perspective to join the EU later market afterward, labor market afterwards, and not the local labor market. Does the EU or any individual EU country has the intention to develop the labor market also in the Balkan countries? Because if not, that means that the trend of leaving the countries will not change. So this is the uh, comment or opinion of the, uh, the person from the chat. And this is it for the moment. And um, I would still encourage uh, people to uh, write us questions or also raise their hands. We can also have in the, in the final round, um, if, if uh, Anya allows and if time allows, uh, somebody asking also a question directly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Christian, for posing these questions and indeed Actually, all the questions uh, which were posed are questions to, to all our panelists. Um, therefore, I would like to ask you, uh, just in the same order, uh, maybe as we started the first round, uh, to pick up the question. Uh, I would like to ask you to pick up the question about the need category, uh, whether it's uh, more stigmatization or it's just a classification. So do we need it or uh, what, what do you think? And uh, the last question about the role of the European Union. Um, so maybe some of you can, can answer the question from the perspective from the region. Should the EU be engaged? And uh, most probably yes, but how? And uh, But also as a question to Drexelmeyer and uh, to the German Kosovo Business Association, it would be the question, are the companies already engaged? Uh, should be done more uh, by the European uh, Union uh, to support those support those activities, and the question of the transparent job market and politicization of the job market. I actually would like to leave for the third round because, from my perspective, that would be also a good uh, uh, a good question to to make the shift to the next panel uh, on domestic reforms part two. Um, so maybe we can also leave there some answers um, and remarks uh, for a discussion uh, already in the next panel. So the floor is yours, Ivana, and we would like to hear uh, your comments. And also, yes, please, uh, if you have any comment on the topic on trade unions, I would also really appreciate uh, these comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question on the categorization. I, I really didn't expect it. Uh, and I'm really happy that we got it. I don't really, uh, I'm not sure I will be able to address it fully. But uh, to me personally, and uh, to me as a professional, uh, this question is a question that I associate closely with the issue of social justice. The reason why I'm saying that this is the framework within which I would look at it is that yes, this is a question that is closely related to the practice of discrimination and sometimes physical segregation, which is very frequent in case of Roma communities across the Western Balkans. So the different features, different characteristics uh, and abilities of our citizens in the Western Balkans clearly determine their life chance, chance, chances, including access to education, access to uh, labor market, this uh, has to be actively ag addressed. Currently, it, it has been addressed, but only at policy level, including legislative, as uh, Francesca was pointing quite perfectly to the, you know, to the point. Uh, she was saying, like, yes, this is the issue of political will, and this is the issue of implementation. We live in societies where uh, education systems are highly centralized. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, decisions are made in a manner that doesn't include the participatory approach. Uh, neither schools, nor teachers, nor school leaders are there to, to, uh, to, have their, uh, to have their say. So this is something that has to be actively addressed by specific policy measures. And um, uh, there is a tricky part whether this is only needed as a means of categorization or classification. Once you start talking in different categories, you open the space for discrimination, but at the same time, you open the space to actively intervene in improving 
specific populations positions. So on that question, I think I have a very strong view. I don't know if my colleagues uh, on the panel would agree. Uh, am I allowed uh, to share a comment uh, to Barbara's um, uh, presentation, which I, I mean, all yes. of the presentations were absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, I recalled uh, a sentence uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, which goes like this, train them and they will leave. Don't train them and they will stay. And it's, you know, it's a dilemma of a company. It's a dilemma of a country. Uh, bottom line is that there is no alternative to investing in education. And maybe I should stop here. Thank you very much. And it's a perfect uh, handover to Barbara. <laughs> and please, your comments. You have to unmute yourself, please. Yes, you, I know, I know. Do you know the sentence, what is first, the hen or the egg? And actually, that's the problem. We are talking of, about unemployment. And I think it doesn't matter if you have highly skilled young people in the academic uh, career or in the professional education. For unemployment, it means you need companies and companies mean job. So it doesn't matter how you qualify as long as you don't have companies, big ones, small ones, foreign ones, uh, local ones. That's first of all. So for me, as I said, hen or egg, to get companies in a country, you need qualified uh, people. And of course, some people are leaving, but I'm sure if I qualify 100 young people as mechatronics, maybe 30, 20, uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 per percent are leaving, but still they stay enough in the country to work together and to improve the country system, the social system. And I have friends in Romania. I have a friend, for example, he is, I, I'm always impressed when he starts talking. He knows a lot of language. He's a technical person. He is on a high proficiency. He could easily find a job in Germany, in America, or somewhere around the world, but he stays because he wants to build up his own country. And as Boris mentioned, it's a lot of history, but history is something, the future is another thing. And you have to improve professional education. We are very good on uh, academic uh, uh, qualification, but we need professional education to get companies in the countries. And you're talking about the European Union support. I think there is a lot of support from Europe, from the country, but we need companies who see the future in, the, in your countries, in the Balkan areas. So who is first, 10 or 8? <laughs> Yeah, that's it. It's, it's always uh, the question. And finally, we have to be optimists. And therefore, yeah. that's why we are here as a German Eastern Business Association as well to promote these countries as well as yeah. destinations yeah. for investments. And indeed, we have to discuss all the questions which were discussed at the beginning of the conference about good governance, about a fight against corruption, because finally, uh, companies can support the economic development, but they need the politics first to improve yeah. the investment climate. And I think that's a strong point you made here as well. And uh, so, but uh, nevertheless, I would give the floor to Boris um, to comment on these topics. Thank you. Uh, I'll also try to be brief. Uh, with regards to the need, uh, there's, a, there's an, also another overlooked issue with regards to the Western Balkans countries and their educational systems. Uh, most of the countries are actually uh, European champions in uh, fewest number of those who leave school. So if you, if you think about the EU, Slovenia and Croatia are the countries with the least early school leavers. I'm saying that because of the following thing. Uh, if you think about like a uh, neat uh, kind of stigma that is being attached to the people, it is there not because of the lack of willingness to participate in education. Uh, people people participate here in education. And moreover, I would say that the education is one of the familial and societal values of the highest sort in Balkans. And that's so often overlooked by the politicians. They do not understand it. So they have the schools, they have the people that go to schools. They have the people who are kind of doing stuff to 
keep in the schools. However, what's missing is uh, making these schools and the education in them relevant, interesting, motivating, and, and in a way that can fulfill this dual role of personal development and employment as such in the future. And if you think about it, I would say that the blame is, uh, if, if one needs to be blamed, blame, blame is on the political elites within this region over the years. You know, they're the ones who are misinterpreting the situation and misinvesting in wrong things rather in, than in the education. And that brings me to the labor market and the issue of intervention into the labor market, and especially intervention by the EU in the labor market. I think that that's that's a really dangerous idea if you think about it. Um, you know, like we are coming from the socialist past in a way. You know, like the the overly country or you know like supra country regulated uh, labor market is. I don't think that's the way to go here. I think there is a much better way to go. Is basically to uh, to develop to societies to develop into both cooperative and competitive societies. You know, like no one from outside can solve these issues. All of us have a personal freedom, you know, like to go abroad and to, to, to fulfill our life dreams and aspirations as, as much as we want. But with regards to the society and with regards to the countries here, there is a much higher stake, you know, and there, there, there is a much higher level of strategic thinking needed for these countries to become and realize their own potential. And I think that, you know, like if we speak about labor market here, it, for me, it's completely understanding, understandable that young people are looking for their opportunities and then they will fulfill them wherever these opportunities are achievable to them. But from the perspective of the country and speaking now as a public, as an intellectual in old way, you know, old kind of way, the one who guards for a public good, I would say that, you know, like the, I agree with Barbara that people should be equipped. Some of them, they leave, but those who stay, you know, and some of those who leave will come back, but those who stay should have the environment that they feel safe, that they feel, uh, you know, like in a way that surround, surrounding around them is not blocking them, but allowing them to, you know, like to fulfill their own aspirations in the context that they were raised. So I think, you know, like, I don't think that intervention should be there on any, be any behalf, except the intervention in the educational system with regards to making a higher quality of educational system with a higher equity of the educational system. And I think that that's where we, you know, like, we come back to the issue of needs, you know, and what Ivana said, under, underprivileged groups who are often overlooked, often stigmatized, you know, like, and within themselves, they themselves have the potential also of becoming, you know, like very constructive parts of this, of this, of the societies and the European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to give Fent over directly to Nora because I saw a lot of uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, in your head. And uh, after then, uh, for a short intervention, Barbara, you would like that you would like to directly comment on Boris. Okay, so Nora, maybe I just allow. Uh, Two sentences. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to say something to uh, Boris and to all of you. What I realize is that political shareholder are very changing very fast. And with the change of the shareholder, always the direction for education sector also changes. That makes it not easy. In my opinion, we need a medium and long-term strategy and concept. That means a business plan behind it with condensed, with learning contents, with tasks, with deadlines, investments and responsibility. But as I said, it changes, you know, a new mayor, new direction, a new minister, new direction, a new school leader. That's how it is. So to be really trustful in a, in a system, it needs long distance goals. And that's actually what we are missing. And I'm fully on Boris' side. Actually, all of you are saying the things which I can just make. Yes, that's how it is. But Thank uh, you. Just, just if, Anya, if I okay. can just yeah. briefly answer, you know, like that, uh, Barbara, uh, I mean, you're completely right. And as I said, like there's a lack of strategic thinking with regards mm -hmm. to the both national and you know, like wider goals within the in these nations. However, there is another, and I'm speaking from my own personal experience. There is a very large support for the raise of the quality of education within these, within these nations. There has been very few countries in the world, and I can say that Croatia is one of them, where you know, like tens of thousands of people came to the streets for the educational reform, not against the educational reform. Oh, yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a such a bizarre concept. Now we are speaking about the inefficient educational systems where people, you know, like general people, public, 
wants better education for their own children and you know like for young people themselves mm -hmm. however there is a you know like lack of impetus and lack of pressure on politicians to make it a long term goal so my advice to the, all of the people you know like eastern from here and also to the west you know is to make that pressure on politicians Thank you. Uh, so, Noah, now the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. I've nodded a lot because I agree with everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, especially with what Bore said now. So, I see this in Kosovo as well. There is a lack of vision. We have a lot of strategies because we also have a lot of support from donors to write strategies, but they end up somewhere. Nobody really has a vision where wants this country to go. So what is this, what is the Kosovo that we want? And according to that, we could also try to uh, reform uh, and see what kind of skills will be needed in the next five years. I know we cannot predict this because everything is uh, um, developing very fast, especially now with digitalization, but still there are some trends that could be followed. But coming back to what was said to, uh, from many of you, there's a lack of political will as well, because which government would take over to reform or to do such a risky step uh, if they know beforehand that they cannot achieve it during a normal mandate of, let's say, four years, like it is in Kosovo. And uh, this is why we really need to work all clo very close together and to enhance this pressure in order to have interventions in the education system. And I'm not talking about vocational education systems, but we need interventions really in these uh, yeah, preschool um, uh, programs that we have because skills that companies uh, need, they are developed from the beginning. And uh, I think this is lacking, not only in Kosovo, in the, in the neighboring countries as well. And uh, this is where, um, yeah, we should have, we, I mean, in Kosovo, it would be definitely our, our chamber to put some pressure and to advise the government. But on the other hand, we're just one of the many stakeholders. And this is what's needed. In regard to the question uh, uh, about you, yeah, I agree with Barbara there. There's a lot of support already here. And especially in Kosovo, we have so many donors. Everybody wants to do something good for the country. But yeah, but we also need to live some, um, to leave some um, responsibility and ownership to the locals, to yeah. the local yeah. companies yeah. who need to be encouraged to invest in their future staff because most of them lack this uh, readiness. Uh, they want to have things very fast, especially now, right now. So they cannot wait for this, um, for their people to be trained mm -hmm. nine months and three years and so on. They want to have them now. But on the other hand, they are not ready to pay for those services. So we have in Kosovo even training education providers which are private and they have difficulties to partner up with companies that need staff. And it's really absurd if you analyze all this, we need so much more time to talk about all these difficulties. But you see, we have identified the problems and there are of course solutions. And uh, yeah, it's just that as Barbara said, we need an action plan and to, to, to see until when what needs to be done. And sometimes even these regional um, objectives that have to be, um, have to be met uh, as a Balkan region are good to put pressure on each uh, and every government of the Western Balkan six. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Nora. And last, but again, not least, <laughs> Francesca, the floor is yours. And maybe you can also already pick up the question because it was actually the question to you whether there is a transparent job market in Albania, right? Uh, so uh, maybe you can uh, also refer to that one. And um, afterwards, I will give the floor again to our co-moderator because there are some comments in the chat uh, we would like to share with you too. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, if we would have transparency, not in Albania, but in all Western Balkan, we were not uh, uh, being participated in this uh, conference. And I think that the lack of the uh, tra job transparency in Albania is uh, a huge problem as it is in other countries. Uh, uh, of Western Balkan, and for this reason, a reform for public in for the public administration has been undertaken. But what I see more among your young people is the lack of trust that they have in the governments. So whatever the government uh, might undertake, 
uh, young people do, do not trust anymore in their action that, and that they have and that they will have concrete results. Uh, so at the day that we speak, we need more uh, concrete results and we need more role mo models also of uh, person that have already go uh, uh, to a, a path of uh, a successful career uh, in uh, Albania or in uh, Western Balkan countries without uh, being part of uh, this kind of system. And uh, I highly agree with uh, the other participants uh, about, uh, about uh, the, the rule of law and the other problems uh, raised because uh, the problem that we are addressing today, it's a problem that it is uh, an intersectoral problem. So if we uh, speak about the needed skills, we also uh, speak about the, the education system, we also speak about the rule of law, and we also speak about uh, uh, the form that our governments work. Um, and so on. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca. I hand over to Christian for the second, or, yeah, the second round of questions from, and remarks from the audience. Thank you very much, Anja. Um, the debate continues also among our more than uh, 100 people in the audience. And there's not uh, too much of questions right now, but rather two statements I found interesting and uh, would like to add. And uh, one statement adds an aspect we have not so much touched upon so far, which is the question of motivation. And uh, the, the uh, viewer says, I would also add the negative impact of remittances for discouraging youth to take up jobs in domestic market. Like in any other immigration country, remittances raise the reservation wage for the youth. So um, also here a different kind of, uh, of effect um, we have not talked about yet. And um, the second uh, remark is also um, a, a very interesting and also moving example where somebody uh, says that I think Albania also has a very politicized education uh, system, which is also very corrupted. If you are a politician, if you know a powerful person, or if you can pay, you can get better or excellent marks. Um, my cousin got, uh, got depressed by seeing corrupted professors and uh, decided to leave university and did not continue studying. So um, I think also an, uh, an aspect which is uh, relevant uh, also for the other countries and not necessarily only for the one mentioned here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for these um, remarks uh, from the audience. Actually, I would like to ask uh, now also our panelists to pick up the question on politicization of the uh, job market. Uh, the question we shifted a bit to later because uh, uh, of the next panel and uh, to, to, to have, yeah. Uh, to give maybe also some comments to, to the discussion of the next round. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, I would really be curious to, to get your uh, insights and remarks on that one. And also, uh, yeah, on the effects of remittances. Um, so uh, the question, or for me, it would be indeed a question whether it is... Uh, how we can link it also to, to, to the question of unemployment and youth unemployment. Is there a direct link? Is there really such a motivation not be motivated to be part of the real job market? I'm not sure, but I'm curious also to, to hear your answers on that one. And um, so uh, the floor is yours. And uh, this time I would like to start... Okay, <laughs> I would like to start the other way around and give the floor back to Francesca. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, there, there is a, there is a low motivation of young people to participate in the labor market and. Uh, to take the courage to, to do something, uh, to do something different and maybe to invest their energy and to invest their capacity uh, in a country where uh, the rule of law uh, is in lack and, and uh, much other aspect that, that doesn't work uh, in, the, in the right uh, 
uh, aspect. But in the meanwhile, uh, when we speak about uh, uh, higher rate of uh, unemployment among young people, I think that there are some uh, uh, concrete action that might be undertaken. So in the moment that uh, young people uh, have finished uh, their uh, have finished uh, their study to be prepared for the labor market and it request. One of uh, these uh, action would be career uh, guidance from the secondary school. So young people will be sm smoothly oriented through the needs of the labor market and uh, further choose the relevant studies. And uh, we have also uh, uh, mentioned the vocational education and uh, it was also mentioned uh, uh, among the question that uh, uh, we took, uh, which I find that is a bright opportunity for uh, young people, not only in uh, Albania, but in Western Balkan as well, uh, to take a decent job and uh, to be part of the labor market uh, of uh, the country. Because by taking into consideration the percentage of the young people that uh, mostly uh, decide to choose like uh, economic or other uh, studies, uh, we will have a lack of uh, uh, professions uh, for the most usually uh, aspects like an electrician, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you also to Christian, who reminded me that we just have uh, some minutes left to the end of this panel. I